Hey everyone, Nicole Steckline, technical agronomist for DeKalvin Asgro in Northeast Iowa. And when I did this part of the video, I forgot to press record. So you're gonna get this first part um, from the comfort of our swing set. If I had to describe this growing season in one or two words, it would have to be variable and dry. And there's a lot of discussion, has been a lot of discussion about what did the heat from that past week do to our crop and what is the upcoming wheat heat going to do to our crop as well. And to um, even come up with maybe some harvest predictions, what do we think our yield is going to be before we get out there? So to look to the future, we have to look to the past. And I think looking at our planting windows is gonna have a lot to do with what our yield is at the end of the se season. So when we look at the planting windows in the state of Iowa, we had really three, maybe call it four different planting windows. You had that super early one right after Easter, that April 10th to the 15th window. Um, really that one, we probably have the most variable stands, probably some of our lowest stands from that planting window. The next one, which I really think was our best planting window, uh, was that last week of April to the first week of May. So that stuff gave us some of our best stands, our most even and consistent stands because we were on a warming trend. We didn't have to worry about the snow like we did the first one. Um, and we did get a little bit of rain. Now that being said, that little bit of rain is what hurt the planting window that got hurt by the Mother's Day Massacre. So that planting window of about May 9th, 10th, 11th, that's the stuff that we had a lot of crust. We have a lot of reduced plant stands because of the crust. And we've got a lot of soybean acres that ended up having to be replanted or have some seed put in there. The planting window after that, that mid-May window, also wasn't super consistent because we just straight up didn't have any moisture. So there was a lot of variability in which seeds got planted into moisture and which ones did not, which then created a variable emergence stand to it. So decent stands, but extremely variable in how and when they came out of the ground. And then those plants have had the least amount of moisture on them because they missed out on anything that happened early May or April. So that was our planting season kind of in a nutshell. And then honestly, ever since that, the main point has been how dry that we have been. Now a common comment that we get up until about two weeks ago was, how does it, it looks so good. How does this crop still look this good considering the lack of moisture that we've had? And the answer is temperature. So I've been pulling a lot of weather data lately and I find this to be very interesting. So this is data from Fayette, Iowa, which is pretty central to my territory. So you look at this and I've got three different graphs. That top one there is the GDU accumulation. We're looking at a window from middle of April up until present day. That top one is GDU accumulation. The middle is precipitation accumulation. And that bottom graph is the SDD or stress degree day accumulation. Now, I ran this data versus 2012, which was our last major drought. And the one especially, you know, for my generation, 2012 is our 1988. So when you look at this top graph here, right? So you've got that black line is average. The green line is GDU accumulation in 2012. And that red line is GDU accumulation for 2023. Relative to average, 2023 is spot on with where we kind of expect to be. Where you look at 2012 and we were way above in GDU accumulation. You look at precipitation and we are actually drier in Fayette than we were in 2012 and obviously much below average. And then that correlates with the GDU accumulation that correlates very well to that bottom graph, which is stress degree days. This is why we look better versus 2012. It's not because we've had more moisture. It's because we've had less heat stress than 2012. So now that brings us to today um, and making some predictions. So first and foremost, this is very general and making predictions doesn't change a darn thing, but sometimes it can at least help to understand why things happen and also set some expectations. So. First and foremost, soil type. Soil type is probably going to be the number one indicator on where you're gonna be at when it comes to yield. Fertility is going to be another huge indicator on where you're at both in terms of yield 
and standability. And then I think also, obviously, there's been a lot of variability in moisture. Some people were able to grab an inch of rain that the guy a mile down the road got nothing out of. So the amount of moisture as a whole, particularly if you got it in late July and in August. I think the other big thing is going to be planting date. So I think some of our best yields is going to come from that last week of April, first week of May. The first reason is because of stand establishment. We've got the most amount of consistency and the most plants out there from that planting window. But the other thing is going to be, is probably going to have heavier, deeper kernels than the stuff that was planted after it. And here's why. So as we get into grain fill, really one of the big determining factors is when we get that stress or when that plant dies early, what stage was it at and how much of that dry matter had accumulated in that kernel prior to the stress. So at beginning dent, you've got about 45% of your dry matter accumulated in that kernel. By quarter milk line, you've got about 65% accumulated. Half milk line, which is where a lot of this crop is sitting at, half to three quarter milk line. At half, you got about 90% of your dry matter accumulated. By three quarter milk line, you got 97% of your dry matter accumulated. So the earlier and the more long that you, and the more time that you spend in that stress, the more there is up for grabs, the more that you could potentially be losing. So that's why I think the earlier planted, by the time we got a lot of that stress two weeks ago and the stress coming into this next week, we had a lot more dry matter accumulated already where the later planted stuff, A, it did not get as much moisture as everything else and it struggled out of the ground and we got a lot of bricks on those sidewalls because of the heat and the dry. So they also have a more restricted root mass. Um, but this heat coming in here, that later planted stuff is going to have two major stressful heat events during grain fill, while the stuff that was planted early really only has one of those major heat events as opposed to being affected by two of them. Now, the other question on other people's mind is what about test weight? So let's remember though, there's a difference between yield loss from kernel size, which is probably what we're gonna end up and having low yield due to a poor test weight or that really chaffy grain. So one of the things that's happening to us right now and the comment is it's happening fast. Things are happening fast and that's absolutely true. There's plenty of studies out there that show that as we increase our temperatures, we're actually decreasing the number of days that that plant is taking because yes, technically you only accumulate GDUs up to 86 degrees but we've had plenty of days hotter than that. And what's happening is that it still is causing that plant, particularly during grain fill, to speed up its development. So if you wanna look at the very extreme, you can take that plant from having almost 40 days to fill grain and get to black layer and almost cut that in half in a very extreme case. I would wager that this year, we've probably cut at least 10 days off of the grain fill period, which means fewer days, fewer sunlight hours to take the energy from the sun, pull carbon dioxide and create sugars to put in that kernel. So much of our yield loss from this heat is because we aren't having as many days to fill that kernel, the kernel is going to be smaller. Now when it comes to test weight, that's all about kernel density and the type of starch that that plant has inside of that kernel. So we're usually going to be hurting more from a test weight perspective when we have an early and unnatural death. Whether that unnatural plant death is caused by a disease such as tar spot or crown rot, or if it's happening from drought stress or a early frost causing that early plant death. That's when you get, I would almost call it like an artificial or premature black layer that that plant wasn't really meaning to put on. It happens really quick and that plant hasn't had the time to really change it from a soft starch to a hard starch, which is what's essentially what is affecting the density of the starch in the kernel. Okay, I said a lot of not very fun things to hear, but it had to be said. Hang with me because there's just a little bit more to talk about. So aside from some of the yield loss, we're also looking at standability loss as well. So we said it, this crop is going fast. We're going to be getting to black layer here in this next week in a fair amount of cases. 
in the next seven to 10 days. Do not be scared to go out there and pick wet corn. You're gonna do yourself a massive favor because when you look at the amount of cannibalization that's happening, we're stealing all of the nutrients and all of the carbohydrates from the stalk because we can't get anything from the soil. So we are filling that grain at the expense of the stalk. When you have a lot of cannibalization, that stalk is weak. But the other thing that happens is that you start getting crown rots and you start getting stalk rots much quicker. So we always know that we're gonna get one of those nights in October where you get about 40 to 50 mile an hour wind for an extended period of time, maybe a 10th of an inch of rain with it, and it's going to fall over. So be on top of going out there and getting it because of the cannibalization. Now, not just the cannibalization of stalk rot and crown rot, but the added stress of not being able to get any potash. Potash plays a huge role in stalk integrity. And that corn plant, all plants really, are like a guy that gets in a bar fight and gets his jaw wired shut. It cannot pull up any nutrition unless it's in liquid form through a straw. So this nutrient that plays a huge role in stalk integrity, we aren't hardly getting any of it. So there's another reason why these plants are not going to be standing very well. And then you add on top of that potential crown and stalk rot. Now, I know that these things, these fungal diseases are mostly associated with a wet year. However, they are also very well associated with a stressful year. So if you look at that plant having trouble at emerging, that's when things like Fusarium crown rot invade that plant and then it just kind of sits there and it waits for stress to occur. Now that stress can be as little as just grain fill, but add on environmental stress during that and cannibalization, you're gonna have crown rot showing up, which is gonna make that plant fall over even faster. Now on the other side, when it comes to herbicides and weeds, we need to be thinking about 2024 because when we sprayed a lot of our herbicides, we need water to get those things to be in soil solution so that that weed seed soaks it up and allows it not to germinate. But we didn't get a whole lot of that, which means that we didn't get very good weed control out of our residual herbicides. Even when I go into cornfields, um, I'm walking through and you can see water hemp, water hemp, water hemp, water hemp. Now it's not a carpet of it by any means, but think about how many seeds are on that single water hemp plant. We are setting up, we are building that seed, that weed seed bank, and we're going to have to think about how aggressive and on top of things we're going to need to be this next year, particularly if that field is going to go into soybeans. And then thinking about our corn herbicide program, Yes, we have more herbicide options when it comes to the corn, but we need to make sure that we're on top of it because some of these soybean fields are looking pretty weedy because of mother nature. Now on top of that, one more thing, and then I'll stop bringing you all of the bad information and I'll give you a break, but the potential for herbicide carryover into this next year. The two weeks following herbicide application, the amount of water that you get in that two weeks has a lot to do with the breakdown of that herbicide. We were very dry after our herbicide applications this year. So we are at a very high risk for having herbicide carryover, particularly into our soybean crop this next year. So if you aren't depressed now, you are a very optimistic person. That's all that I have for today. If you guys have any questions at all, please reach out, call, text, or email. Have an excellent weekend.